Hello everyone and welcome to a video where I basically discuss aspects of G-Persia if you go to my school, um, which basically means that you analyze regions or you analyze social, economic, political, artistic, intellectual uh, aspects of history to really get a well-rounded picture. Um, I'm making these videos essentially to further analyze them in more depth because these are really, really big conceptual or thematic concepts that... Um, if you can really, really nail these down, you're going to have a better and well-rounded understanding of history, and it's just going to make reading so much easier for you. Um, for example, history is a very cyclical thing. What happens in one country probably has happened elsewhere due to very, very similar factors. Um, for example, revolutions, they happen for somewhat similar reasons, granted, you know, key people are different and not every situation is a hundred percent the same but relatively speaking about 70 percent of situations that end up the way they do is because another situation in history or you can connect it to another situation in history that was 75 percent or 70 percent similar to that so if you can really really understand these concepts reading history is not going to be that much of an issue you're just kind of be like filling the dates or the names at that point you're really just reading to figure out you know who what when not really why and how because if you understand the why and how conceptually it's not going to be that hard so without a further ado um, let's get right into this video um, it's really broken down into two parts social and economic and I'm going to uh, make a video about politics and religion in another video um, because they're kind of in their own area but um, yeah, I'm going to start with socioeconomic uh, this episode. And the first thing you got to finally understand is there is a difference between social class and economic class. If you can really kind of differentiate those two things, you're going to be able to do pretty well when it comes to analyzing these concepts in history. So what is an economic class? This is a class solely based off of wealth. When you hear the word middle class or upper class or lower class, it kind of gets confusing to people. So the best way I could say it, you can say high economic class, so the rich, and then there is the poor. If you were going to use Marxist terminology, you're going to hear this in books, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Now, there's somewhat of an in-between, which is the middle class, and they're called the petite bourgeoisie. So these are just terminologies you should know because they're going to be used in your books. But these are really just referring to people who have stuff, a.k.a. means of production, they own it, they own the resources, they own all these things, and people who don't own these things, these things being resources, right? Uh, for example, a worker doesn't really own a factory, they don't own entrepreneurship, they don't own um, their own labor, their labor, they sell it right um to other people so that is called the working class okay um and you're going to hear that a lot when you get to units like industrialization so you're going to really differentiate these things when you see terms like the working class you're going to see things like poor you're going to see things like the proletariat they all and i may have spelled that wrong but all of these are really just synonymous for the same thing that they don't make money and they do not and this is the biggest point they do not own means of production and this is referring to a capitalist system which for the majority of history has been the main economic system that has occurred since you know the year 1400 in many many countries then you're going to hear another type of class and that is the bourgeoisie. These are the people who own the means of production. So they own your labor. They own scarce resources like land, right? Um, for example, if a factory is being made, the owner of that factory is part of the bourgeoisie because they own the land that they are making the, the goods with. So they own resources, okay? They own labor. They own factories, so on and so forth. But these guys are also just going to be referred to as the rich, okay? Then you have social class. Social class is partly based off of wealth, but it is primarily based off of your culture, your behavior, and really your identity that has values connected to it. And the best way I can explain this is that you could be high social class, but you could be like middle class when it comes to the economy, okay? You could be, for example, from royalty. This is a really, really great example. These are people, right, that have been deemed to be the upper class so you're going to hear things like the upper class when it comes to terminology you're going to hear like aristocracy and these are these are all synonymous for the same thing again but these people are naturally 
here because society wanted them here to a degree. There is a social idea of what they should be. For example, if you think of aristocracy, you think of the way they act. You know, you think of snobbery. You think of all these things that are associated with their own culture, right? These are cultural things. Now, does this mean that, for example, a really, really rich person cannot be in the upper class? No, it doesn't. You know, you could be poor. You could be rich. It doesn't matter. It's really your culture. OK, and these people or your cultural values, right, are what's going to divide up the upper class, the middle class. And they're going to also divide the lower class. OK, now, does this mean that if you're lower class, you can go to middle class? Well, it can mean that based off of your wealth sometimes, but also it's a cultural adaptation. There's a really, really great example of this in history. If you understand U.S. history, there used to be these people that got really, really rich in the 1890s, right? Because of the Second Industrial Revolution. And you would say, okay, well, they're obviously bourgeoisie, right? They are really, really rich, but they were never accepted as a part of the aristocracy or the upper class in America because of their way they acted. They were not born rich. Or they were not born into this wealth. They had to build it. And as a result of that, the way they acted culturally was not the same as the way they acted, you know, uh, or not the same that people interacted in the upper class. And as a result of that, they were actually rejected from joining them for a long period of time until they slowly integrated themselves into it. It takes time to go from upper to, or sorry, from middle to upper class. Whereas for economic class, it's not really, well, it's hard, but it's not as hard to go from working class to, you know, the petite bourgeoisie to bourgeoisie. Whereas you have to get legitimate and genuine acceptance from an overwhelming portion of each class to join them. Okay. So these are all in, in, they have their own values, so you can really associate aristocracy with snobbery. Think of like the royal families. They're all culturally or societally viewed as like high up. Middle class, these people really just value education. They're like the backbone. Um, most people in, you know, most countries that run the economy are the middle class. They value, and, and you can really see who the middle class is because they live in urban areas. And this is just great. Um, what I'm listing right now are just tools to identify these groups because you're going to get tested on like, okay, who does what? And the middle class are the people that are really, really important because they're the ones who really start social reform in most, most cases in history. Um, again, I'll explain it later on why they do this and why it's them, not the upper class and not the lower class. But um, yeah, and the lower class, these, uh, these guys are like, you can, well, you can think of them as like, um, you know, they're, they're typically working class, but it doesn't mean that that's necessarily the case, right? You could be a lower uh, petite bourgeois, but they're the working class. They kind of just want to, you know, get get their stuff through with. They, they don't really have um, they're not the they're not the movement pushers. Put it like that. The middle class are the ones who are primarily educated in history. Now, obviously, that's changing in the modern day. But if we look at it in a strict historical lens, the majority of the population is obviously the lower class. But they're just kind of there. OK, um, and I'll again explain why that is the case. But now that you've had these um, distinctions made between who is what and what is what, I can now begin finally explaining concepts about socioeconomics that are going to make a little bit more sense. OK, so pause the video, by the way, if you don't understand these and rewind it so you can fully really grasp this um, because you're going to be lost throughout the rest of the video. Anyways, so number one, the biggest concept of social class is education. OK, now what I want to note is that as history has progressed, access to education has increased thanks to things like the printing press, thanks to governments allowing education to be more socialized to other groups of people. But education is a thing that really, really defines the middle class and the upper class. These people are the ones that were viewed as educated. Now, education is a very, very, very big thing because it's a double edged sword and I've noted it here. See, education can be used in two methods, right? It could be used to mobilize the government or mobilize the people and there's an economic benefit to it, but there's also a government or an upper class benefit to education and it's known as indoctrination. 
put it like this. When it, education systems were first created and were socialized to the mass public in Germany or aka Prussia in like the late 1700s, and this is just stuff you don't really need to know, they were created in specific ways to teach people only the things that the upper class wanted. So recognize that education is typically controlled by the upper class, okay? And they were teaching people things that they wanted them to know because they recognized that if you are really, really educated, you're going to be questioning things that society has put, these arbitrary restrictions like, oh, you can do this, but you can't do that. People will sit back and, and take a look back at their governments and be like, okay, well, why can't I do that? Like, who says, you know, I have to do that? And you're really going to see education associated with things like the Enlightenment. You're going to see it associated with the civil rights movement as well. Um, and also suffragist movements. The reason for that is because of the other part of education. It's the double-edged sword. People will sit back and be like, okay, well, look, um, I understand that, you know, this is the way society runs, but is this the best way society can run? So they begin critiquing governments. They begin saying, okay, well, what are these arbitrary restrictions imposed upon us? So this demonstrates how education can be used against the upper class, even though it was created by the upper class. The other aspect, as I mentioned, was indoctrination. And like I mentioned, indoctrination is a tool, essentially, or a, or a key word that is used by the upper class or their intent is to indoctrinate people to think certain things. They want them to not question the government. So if the upper class is a really, really smart and, and educated upper class and they know how to control the population, they're going to do a damn good job at indoctrinating the, like, the country to understanding, you know, these are the values, these are what you have to stick by, and, you know, you should be questioning the government. You're going to see that a lot with fascist countries or authoritarian countries i will later explain that in another video about what it means to be authoritarian and the attributes associated with it but you're going to see a high degree of indoctrination when education is used as a tool for social reform um lastly another tool for social reform is education like i mentioned i just repeated myself i'm kind of dumb my bad but it's used as a tool for social reform by the middle class as well and they typically do this because they're the ones who are um, critiquing the governments. They're the ones who really, really begin, you know, thinking all these enlightened ideas. It's the middle class, really, not the upper class, who typically begins revolutions. They're the ones who have a remote degree of freedom. And when you educate them, um, when you educate them and you take away their freedom, they're going to start revolutions because they kind of understand how freedom is supposed to be. And I'm, I'm getting a little bit into politics, but, but note this. When you take away their freedom, and the middle class has always typically had a higher degree of freedom than the lower class, they understand what they're going back towards, you know, the, the regression of their freedom, and they're going to get upset. And because they have this tool of education, they're typically going to favor it to more and more people so they can get more and more people to join their cause of revolting or getting freedoms back. OK, so that is really why the middle class likes um, social reform and why they like education, because they're the ones who have a degree of freedom. And in the case that they lose that freedom, they need to educate the rest of the population, a.k.a. the lower class to uplift them and say, hey, look, you also kind of have to think like this. So you're going to see the middle class being the leaders of social reform as a result of this because they're educated. They're also going to be the leaders of revolutions, typically, because they have the education, they have the means to think critically, which is super, super important. Um, you're going to see these associated with the Enlightenment thinkers a lot. You're going to see these associated with civil rights people as well. Um, and that's why education is so, so, so tied to uh, the middle class, because that is one of their values. They really, really believe that, hey, look, if I, you know, get the right education, I'm going to be able to live a, a, a strong life. I can understand things for myself. I'm going to have a degree. And this is important, a degree of autonomy, because they say like, OK, well, look, I went I went to school. I, I got educated. I understand the way things kind of work. And if you know, I understand the way things kind of work. I could sometimes a use the system to my advantage, the system being the government because they are smart. They can critically think they say, okay, well, I, I can either use a system to my, uh, to my benefit, or if I lose my freedoms, I can then go back to revolution. Um, so that's really where the middle class is. And that's why they're so, so important, right? They have this degree of intellectual autonomy. They can't really, really be controlled, but 
if they want, they can kind of play both cards. So like I said, while they are the leaders of social reform, they can also sometimes side with the authoritarians or the upper class. And I say authoritarian and upper class because typically if you own the government, you're going to be upper class. There's only a reason why you're there. It's because you either have wealth or you have some connections, which is associated with the upper class. So I know I'm kind of rambling on, but recognize the importance of the middle class when it comes to education. Recognize that education is sometimes used by the upper class as an opportunity to indoctrinate, and I'm going to get more into indoctrination in my other episode. And recognize that education is really a tool sometimes used to critique governments, and that's associated with the Enlightenment. And the civil rights movement, people, again, you know, take a step back and say, okay, look, why the hell are these things put in place? And, and do we really need them? And if not, is there a way in which we can reach a medium or a, or a middle ground between, you know, us and, and the rest of society and the rest of society being the upper class who controls the way social systems are typically created? Okay, next up, we're going to have things called family units. And family is a really, really big part when it comes to religious aspects in history. A lot of their tenets are based off, you know, a strong core family. And you're going to see that the middle class, again, is the one favoring these ideas of family units. So when I really do talk about social stuff, I'm really talking about the stuff the middle class favors because, again, they're the reformers. So what do the middle class like when it comes to family units? They think that if you have a strong core, okay, you're going to be able to really, really create productive members of society. And this is an idea known as domesticity. And you're going to see this when it, com when it comes to in regards with a woman. There's going to be uh, the sphere of domesticity and A push. Uh, you also get that into AP Euro. I'm not too sure about AP World. But this, this term of sphere of domesticity is really regarding to the family unit and the relationship a woman has. And I'll talk about women later. But the relationship a woman has in regards to their family. So when you hear, um, you know, the 1950s nuclear family, the woman stays at home and takes care of the children obviously that idea has changed in modern days but when you look at it the purpose of the family unit is to create a strong bond between mother and son and sometimes father and son the father is, was historically expected to work and be the breadwinner but it is essentially used as an opportunity to create a strong relationship, a familial relationship bond between the mother or really the parent and the child. OK, and people or historians back then and a lot of social reformers back then really viewed this as an opportunity to say, look, we are creating productive members of society. If we build a strong relationship with our children, we're going to do a really, really good job of getting them to listen to us. We can pass down family heritage. We can pass down family values to them because if we are nice to our children and we build a good relationship with them, they're going to be much more inclined to be with us they're going to be much more inclined to listen to us we're as opposed if we're an abandoned family and we say screw it and you're going to see this with the working class unfortunately during the industrial revolution where they essentially got so overworked that they couldn't be with their family you're going to see a breakdown of the family unit you're going to see that a lot of the people that were in the working class in the 1800s the late 1800s the early 1900s they didn't really have this strong family unit and as a result of this a lot of the people a lot of the children at least would grow up without a great sense of what it means to be a family you're going to see higher rates of alcoholism as a result of that because they didn't have the comfort the 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 relationship that they should have had with their parents where their parents could have taught them things right taught them how the world kind of works because it takes a real village to raise a child and if you don't have that village and that's a metaphor by the way if you don't have that village then that child is going to be lost and you're going to unfortunately see that with a lot of the working class so you're going to see that this is the family unit is a really popular thing amongst the middle class right um and you know you're going to i'll add a note here um when you have the working or the fam the family unit, family unit, it's easier to pass pass on, you know, family values. Um, so you create a strong, you know, familial bond. That's really what the purpose of this is. And the working class lack this, lack this because they work so much and they can't spend time together. You're going to really, really see this in the Industrial Revolution um, uh, as opposed to uh, other periods in times in history because for example in feudalism the family unit was relatively stronger 
because families were work on the same land, they were much more agrarian, they could share things, okay, and they could kind of work together. So family units in the feudalism periods of time, if you're in AP world, were actually much more stronger than they were in the Industrial Revolution in general, in general. So we're talking working class, we're talking all forms of social and political classes, okay? Um, actually, social class is not necessarily true. You would not see this in feudalism with the upper class simply because they would have duties to regulate the land that they work on. They actually had a higher degree of burden, but that's besides the point. It's a generalization. So when it comes to history, you're also going to see this a lot. And I know that it was kind of a pain, but women and in general, other minorities are going to be talked a lot about in newer history textbooks, uh, not only for their contributions, but the way they were oppressed in the leading um, movements to suffragist movements. So number one is recognize that women are oppressed. That's not really something that, you know, has to be debated. Everyone knows that. But the question is why, right? Um, and that gets into a lot of things, but they were typically viewed as inferior scientifically, scientifically, because they were seen as having smaller brains and larger waists, which justifies this idea of domesticity and staying home okay so that was one idea but a greater question is okay well why would people want to go out of their way to scientifically prove all this what is the inherent thing behind this and while i'm not going to get into the root cause of woman oppression what you should recognize is why did men continue to oppress women well it's because they wanted to have this higher degree of autonomy in the household Remember that if you reject or tell women, tell women they can't work in the economy, they're going to become dependent. And this dependency is an opportunity, is an opportunity for exploitation, for exploitation by whom the men, if your wife or if a woman is inherently reliant on the man for being the breadwinner or making money. Well, they will have to be at their, um, well, they will have to do things at their own will, right? At the man's will. So if a man says do this, well, if they say no, well, what is the result going to be? Well, the result's going to be that they're going to, you know, they could be a, there could be a divorce. And as a result, the woman's going to get kicked, kicked out. And if they don't have any role in the economy, they lose. So it's really to increase men's societal power. And you say, okay, well, why is that important, right? I mean, like, if you're an upper-class woman, you have a lot of societal power because your man's also, or your husband's also a, is an upper-class person. Well, it's important not really for the aristocrats as much, but more important for the people that are in the lower social classes. If society has continuously treated you like shit, okay, why in God's earth, as a poor man, would I want to give up more power, more power or more societal um, privilege, right, to a woman, right? If the only differentiation between going from being the second lowest to the lowest person in society is my sex and my societal, uh, and my society has dictated that being a woman is lower, well, I really want to hold on to any other privilege I have as a man. So you're actually going to see most people who are anti-woman or, or misogynistic in history, not really come from the upper class, but more from the lower class. And I guess I can elaborate on this a little bit more. Uh, I could use the Civil War as an example. Um, this isn't necessarily with women, but minorities. And I really want to get this point across because this point has been used in history to oppress other minorities. So if you look at the Civil War, you're going to really, and, and I hope this is a concept or, a, or an event that everyone could really understand. The majority of the people fighting for the Confederacy and in general in the war were the lower class. They were the poor people and the poor people could not afford slaves because, I mean, slaves are actually relatively expensive. So then you have to ask yourself the question, why in God's name was a poor man fighting for something that the rich man had? Well, in the South, the poor man was so, so treated so, so poorly that really the only thing that would differentiate them from being a bottom feeder, quote unquote, is not being an African-American, which is a sad reality that was, you know, the case. But but to them, this is all they had. This is the only thing that they could say would make them feel a little bit special, that they were being white. 
right? So obviously they would want to fight for an institution that would continue that. Whereas, you know, if the union had won, and fortunately it did, you know, and, and African Americans were then to reintegrate into society and be quote unquote equals because they can now vote and they were viewed as people, there was not going to be an inherent difference eventually between the poor white man and the poor African American man. And that is concerning for the poor white person. So if you were to use this idea, which I kind of introduced, and, I, and unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to go on a big spiel about it. But if you use this idea about, you know, African-Americans in the Civil War and the relationship to the poor white man, if you were to use that and apply the same idea to woman, then it might make a little bit more sense uh, or it's somewhat of an analogy. So you're going to see that really coming from or you're going to see the majority of misogyny coming from from the lower class uh, men, okay? And obviously, you're going to hear about uh, the suffragist movements. You're going to hear about women being the greatest partakers in also social reform. It's going to be the middle class woman. And you're going to ask yourself, and, and I guess an example, this is going to be temperance. If you're an A-push, you're going to learn or anti-alcoholism. Uh, I don't know how to spell that. Hopefully I spell it correctly. Anti-alcoholism uh, in Europe uh, during the 1920s and these, uh, well, 1850s to 1920s. Um, you're going to ask yourself, okay, well, why and why was the middle class again? Remember, they are the social reformers. They have a degree of education where they can critique the government. They have an understanding that is higher than the um, upper or the lower class so they can understand what freedom is and when those freedoms are revoked from them they're going to be upset so recognize that that is why a lot of the movements come from the middle class um, recognize that a lot of the suffragists and social reform comes from women because obviously they're oppressed but you're going to see social reform happening from women because when something goes wrong in society like economically speaking it's going to impact men first and since women are dependent on men right you're going to always ask yourself okay well why did women care about anti-alcoholism like you know women were not the main drinkers that's that's true women were not the main drinkers it was men but it's the men who get most impacted historically by economic and social distraught that it impacts woman as a secondhand result put it like this if your man is a drunken man right and he comes back home from you know consuming shitloads of alcohol well if you're the one who has to deal with that at home then obviously you're going to be concerned so they're going to typically be women are going to be when it comes to social reform they're going to be the ones who secondhand deal with the problem but they're the ones who are also going to have to you know obviously the man's the one who's dealing with alcoholism and losing his family but they're the woman is the one who has to secondhand deal with the problem because they're the ones who are again dependent on the man again a sad reality but something that you should always know um now, I want to talk about, lastly, another topic known as patriotism, and you're also going to see this associated with nationalism. This is really a social um, aspect because it is a social event, like winning a war, that is going to unite people, okay? So nationalism, when it isn't to an ex extreme, is going to be an opportunity to unite, okay? And these are unifications based off social factors in the 1800s for example you're going to see a lot of nationalism based off a shared identity a shared culture it does not matter your political belief necessarily but if you're owned for example by or a shared a shared interest for example in the 1800s there's a rampant degree of nationalism in europe because a lot of people were owned by france and napoleon this is the early 1800s by the way so not owned but Napoleon had invaded their country. So they had a shared interest of repelling another country dictating to them what to do. So that is somewhat of a social event that is happening. They're all unifying under a common cause. Okay. So really, you're going to see patriotism be associated with unification. Okay. Unification under a shared interest. And that could typically be a shared action happening to them. Or a shared culture or language right so for example you're going to see a lot of other countries for example austria hungary revolting again well not austria hungary but the hungarians revolting against the austrians not because they couldn't coexist within the government but because well 
they were effective essentially because they had that shared language, that shared culture where they're like, look, we can unite to each other because we are the same ethnic group and we want to get our rights met. So what does this idea of patriotism really, really do in, in a political sense? And I know I'm getting into politics, but I said I was going to stay into uh, social aspects. Patriotism is really, really effective because of the following. When you are unified, right, you can pack a stronger punch, okay? You can pack a stronger punch, and that is very, very important, right? You're going to be much more effective, okay? That is why you see countries like Nazi Germany, unfortunately, who is hyper-nationalistic, get some, you know, stuff done pretty quickly, right? I mean, they can control half or over half of Europe because they had a pretty high degree of nationalism, a shared interest. And if you could unite people as a result of that, they can punch quicker. They can they can unite. They could be much more organized. There's a higher degree of organization as a result of this. OK, they're also going to be much, much more resilient. OK, so let's say they lose a battle or you lose something as a country. OK, um, your nationalism or your heightened degree of patriotism is going to allow you to endure more. And this is really, really important when it comes to a political sense like war. Because if I know that my final goal is to gain my country's sovereignty and gain my people, you know, the rights they've been fighting for, then damn, I'm going to keep on fighting irregardless of what is happening to me at the given moment. I'm looking at long-term consequences or long-term actions. That's what, you know, nationalism is going to really prompt people to do. You are fighting for the interest of not only yourself, but the interest of all people because you all have the same issues. You all face the same things, which AKA allows you to unify. OK, so again, you're going to pack a stronger punch. You're going to allow, you know, endure more. And that's a good thing because that's going to wear down the enemy. And I know I'm getting a little bit into battle tactics, which you don't really need to know in history. But that's kind of important because that wins wars that won us the American Revolution. Right. Our shared interest of, look, the British have done these evils to us. Let's expel them from, you know, owning us or not owning, but having control over us. We want to be our own people, right? There was a cultural identity. People could unify being an American and what it meant to be an American. And during the American Revolution, that's highly contestable and debatable because there were different regions who had different ideas of that. But at the end of the day, they recognized that they were Americans and the enemy was the British and they could unite as a result of that. OK, um, and that's probably going to also make people fight much, much more ferociously. I don't know if there's a really better word to put it. You're going to fight much harder because you can be more effective. You can you can unify. So it's like if imagine a small or if individuals were fighting, right? Um, they're not going to get as much done as if they're going to be unified. So that's what I meant by pack a stronger punch. So if that didn't really make sense at first, and you could really see this shift in history, shift in history when it comes to the following monarchy or monarch monarchs raising armies or via um, what is it like hired um, or slash trained mercenaries versus a national army. And think about like the French, for example. So. I'm trying to give a lot of historical examples in this. Um, before the French Revolution, the French army used to be composed of mercenaries. OK, people were not necessarily loyal to the monarchy. They were fighting because of money. They were hired. OK, they were not going to be as effective as a French national army that you see arises in the late 1700s to fight against other European nations trying to you know, push back the ideals of the French Revolution. Um, so that's important to recognize when it comes to military history or political military history, monarchs who raised or hired mercenaries to fight for them were not as effective as a national army because a national army was unified, whereas a mercenary was only there for a profit motive. So if stuff went bad and the mercenary was like, OK, well, 
obviously I don't want to really risk my life, they're not going to fight for you anymore. They could probably switch sides. And you see that a lot in early history. So if you're studying history between 1250 to 1450 for you AP world students, you're going to see that, okay, there is a fundamental difference between monarchical armies and national armies raised by the population. Um, if you read about World War I and you read about Great Britain and AP US or AP Euro a little bit, they did not have a draft at the beginning. A lot of people enlisted. And the reason that the British did a relatively better job than other countries that, that who had drafts was because of that heightened degree of nationalism or that heightened degree of patriotism, which allowed and which was stemmed from their cultural beliefs and their shared interests. OK, so that is one last aspect of society um and i'm going to be posting all these notes by the way in the video but um next up is economics and economics ties to society and i will kind of describe that in a bit oops my bad um but right now there are three economic concepts that are almost always described in history it's education again transportation but also just infrastructure so building roads and technology okay um, all of these are really going to be associated with ideas of industrial revolutions. So if you're reading or trying to learn about this, you can only really apply it to the second portion of your first semester when you start to kind of get into ideas of industrialization. But it becomes so, so relevant in your second semester of history where you're like, OK, I really begin to understand all these relative things because industrialization and remember how I was saying history is cyclical industrialization to some degree, um, always happens in, or its its impacts always kind of create a very, very similar thing, okay? So number one is education. Let's ignore the reason why education occurs, right, for either the idea to indoctrinate or for social reform again, but let's look at the impacts of education on the economy. Number one is this idea of the division of labor. OK, the division of labor is really important. And it basically just states is if you're good at something, if you're good at something, specialize in it. OK, so if you are naturally adept to being a strong and muscular person, go do something that requires those skills. If you are someone who likes the arts, go into the arts. Right. We see this a lot in college, but this was not necessarily the case back, you know, in the, the 1700s. I mean, they didn't really even have education systems, but they tried to make you a well-rounded student, not necessarily a student who was really, really good at a one or, or at a specific subject. So division of labor is very, very important. What it essentially did, education and the division of labor, is it allowed for people to be much, much more, much more trained at what they did. So when they are doing or making a good, that good that they make is in a higher quality of good. And that's important, right? Because you want to sell higher quality goods. Why? Because, well, damn, if I sell a higher quality good, I can get more customers, right? That's really the incentive. Remember. The economics, econ I'm not going to get into economic theory, but economics and history for the most part has really been, and, and if you ignore like the Soviet Union and socialist countries, has really been maximizing profit. Okay. So if you have this idea of maximizing profit with the economy, and this is really with a capitalistic, capitalistic or mercantilistic, mercantilistic policy, um, you're going to really see this idea of either more customers, more output. So if you're trained already, you're going to produce higher quality goods. You're really going to also be making less mistakes, less mistakes. And that's important, right? If I only have a series of resources that are finite, well, then I'm going to have to make the best usage of my resources. So if I make less mistakes, that means I can sell more and I can sell things at a better quality, which is going to get more customers. And inherently, it's going to make me more profit, right? Because if I have an increased output and an increased quality, and I'm just going to say the exclamation point because I'm trying to say like it's more, um, I can make more profit because more people are going to buy it and it's going to be more accessible. So you increase accessibility of the good availability of the good which are kind of in relation to each other but also the quality of the good that's really what it does okay but at the same time remember that you are also saving time for the for the labor not the laborer but the the bourgeoisie the guy who owns the company you're saving time you're saving time for timing not time um 
you're saving time not only when it comes to you know making less mistakes but also training remember that you know you had to go and do a lot of training before you enter the field so the company doesn't really have to tell you what to do you're already gonna be trained at what you are you're gonna see this with historically with apprenticeships people do apprenticeships because they want to be good at that one certain certain thing so you know a kid at the age of like 13 would go and become an apprentice for a blacksmith and they'd be really really good at be, you know being a blacksmith so that's really really good because you don't have to when you, when you get the job, you don't have to train the person, so they can really just focus on making that output. Additionally, you're going to see that with these education systems, they would teach you morals of discipline. Now, that is really, really important in the workforce, because imagine if you are disciplined. If you really, really, and this is going to be relevant in industrialization, this is where you really see it. Um, industrialization, I spelled that wrong again. I'm an idiot. You're going to see discipline being really, really important when it comes to the education system as a value because of the following. It creates a social divide, right? It allows for the bourgeoisie to be the bourgeoisie, and it allows the working class to be the working class. Um, and what do I mean by that? Remember that before industrialization, there was really just master and versus serf. Then there became boss versus employee or employer versus employee this discipline prompted individual and and this is important because it creates this new social class or this new economic class the bourgeoisie or the the upper middle class which is which are the bosses the managers right the managers you're going to see that as a result of this okay there is going to be this new social class created and and you're going to have this new social structure because the employee has to respect the boss and as a result of that the boss gets an inherent degree of power and that is important okay that is very very important okay when it comes to applying the idea of education to social structures okay next up it allows allows for the workforce to be more efficient. Remember, efficiency is key. If I can make stuff for less and I can make it more of it, that's what I'm going to be looking for. I'm going to be trying to maximize my profit. Again, really actually understand this idea of maximization. So it's really going to be coming down to efficiency. Efficiency. So when I are able to or if I'm able to discipline my workforce then I'm gonna do a really really good job at making them listen to my rules not only does that give me power but that it also makes me ensure that my factory is running at what it's supposed to I'm not gonna have people disagreeing with me right if I had people disagreeing with me that would be a really really complicating factor okay um, so I can you know just keep on producing that good without having anyone to really really uh, you know, disagree with me. And I just repeated myself, but, but it's just a point, right? You want to make as much as you can. So you want to have that high degree of discipline. Next up is transportation infrastructure. And I'm going to kind of just honestly lodge in technology into this and technology can be really, really vast. So there's, you know, other impacts and economics, but I'm going to explain the different types of technology, but this is our last point or second to last. I'm going to go back to social things uh, really quickly, but transportation, Okay, transportation is so, so important. So is infrastructure because it allows for the movement of goods. Recognize that education helps you increase the amount of goods, but does it help you increase if those goods can re return to that customer? No, it doesn't. It doesn't determine anything, right? It just means that you can make more good. But if you have good transportation, the best thing and the most and, and the most relevant thing of transportation is that you increase your efficiency again but this time you're increasing your efficiency not because you're making more good but because you are ensuring the maximum maximum utility of your good of your good and that essentially means that you're getting the good to the consumer and that is so so important you're not going to make a profit of the consumer is not going to get your good okay that's number one number two is that you also increase the influence a company has Remember that if you can only get to maybe one city, but there are 50 other cities that, you know, haven't had roads built to them, you're only going to influence only one group of people, right? It's the city that you can reach. But if you can increase more roads and you can increase, you know, the amount of shipments you make, well, that's so, so important, right? If you can influence more people 
then you are as a company going to do a much, much better job. Okay. So you increase the influence a company has as you can reach more consumers. And this is really utilizing the notion that you are doing relatively good advertising. So you can really hook the consumer and keep the dependent, keep them dependent on your good. Okay. So you really, really want that to happen. Next up is shipping, right? Shipping costs money. It costs money for me to get that good to point A and B. If it takes me a really, really long route to get there, right? My shipping rates are going to be higher, but my shipping rates will go down if it's really, really quick to get there. So think of like going from a carriage to a car. A car can deliver the good much quicker, and therefore I'm not going to really get charged that much to send my good or ship my good because it's relatively quick to get there. It's not going to be that much of a commute for the person shipping my good. Obviously, I'm not going to do it. Okay, so that is a really, really big, important part shipping rates. If shipping rates drop, you can also reduce the cost of your good. And that means that that good is going to be much more accessible to other people. So again, that is what the accessibility of the good. And I can also maximize my profit because of the following. I don't have to pay as much for shipping, I can reduce the amount that I that, that I have my cost at. So you're reducing costs, while your revenue remains constant. Okay, Revenue is basically how much you make, right? So if I have a good that's $5 and 20 people buy it, you know, five times 20 is going to be my revenue. So a hundred bucks, right? That is my revenue. Uh, and my profit is just going to be my revenue. And I'll just do this equation for you. Profit is going to be revenue minus cost. Okay. And you always want to be positive here and you want to maximize again. Okay. So then you say, okay, I've, I've had all these opportunities and ways to make my profit what and i'm going to get to technology in a second what am i going to do with this profit well what am i going to do with this profit i'm going to reinvest okay that is so so important now that's what historically everyone really did right they reinvested in themselves okay reinvesting in yourself allows you to expand so it allows for the expansion right so you and and to answer what am i going to do with this profit i'm going to centralize it and i'm going to reinvest it for expansion. But what did other people typically do? They said, okay, look, I'm in a competitive market. Maybe I'm not going to reinvest in myself. I'm going to go invest in technology. So you see in the industrial revolution, a lot of these factory workers, fa not workers, but employers or factory bosses are going to, going to invest into technology. And the answer or the question is why? Well, the, the reason is, look, if I'm in a competitive market, so let's say there are 50 companies in my company or not in my company, but in the market I'm going for, and let's say my market is tires, right? I want to be able to attract the most amount of consumers and I want to kill the other businesses. So I'm going to try to adopt a new technology that would allow me to produce goods at a quicker rate and use less resources so that I can effectively kill the other companies and steal all their consumers because I'm producing at a cheaper rate, right? And if I produce at a cheaper rate, it means my costs are going to be lower. That means I could also reduce my revenue or not my revenue, but I could reduce the price I sell things at because I know that more people are going to come in and innately if I have more people. I'm just going to make more profit in general, not because I'm selling goods for less, but because more people are buying from me. OK, so as a result of that, you're going to see a lot of technological inventions. And one of them that is really notable is communication. Communication is so, so important. And you're going to see like things like electricity as well. OK, and you're going to see weaponry. But this is I mean, there's a political aspect to that that I'll get to in a second. But communication is so, so important. Communication allows for the idea or ideas and, and thoughts to be spread quicker. Right. Electricity, very similarly, because think about this. You need you know electricity to use your telephone. You need electricity to kind of get your car to move. OK, so if people can move around quicker, that is so important for the dispersion of ideas and ideas are important because if someone has a new invention, then you want to be able to communicate that invention as quickly as possible. You also reduce, right? If let's say I'm a manager, I don't want to be at my factory 24 seven. So if I can be at the comfort of my own home and I don't have to regulate everyone very quickly, what I can essentially end up doing is stay at my own home and wait for someone to call me to see if there's an issue. And if that's the case, then I can tell them over the phone what to do. So it reduces, it reduces anxiety, right? Um, I remember doing an analysis on just how lights were important, right? Um, and, and that comes to electricity. If I have electricity, right, 
I can run my factory whenever I want to. I don't need coal. I don't need other resources that are, you know, finite. Electricity is much, much more infinite. It's still finite. Don't get me wrong. You need something to burn electricity, but you can get a lot of electricity just off a very small amount. So if I'm having a factory, I can always run my factory if I have electricity. But if I run out of coal, then I'm screwed, right? Imagine if I have a coal run factory versus an electric, an electric run factory or a water run factory, which, you know, that's going to be even worse because I have to be on a coastal city. So all these technological inventions are going to be really, really helpful to just increasing your efficiency to running the factory more frequently, you know, 24-7, so on and so forth. Next up is weaponry. If I can create a weapon, right, a really, like, think about the nuke, right? If I could create the nuke, I could create things called monopolies over my technology. If I can create a monopoly, I gain inherent power because I have that and others don't. And this is going to be really a political analysis. But if I have this technology, and this has happened, you know, numerous times throughout history, if I have this, you know, uh, weapon, you know, weapon monopoly if i have this thing then i can scare other people other others to do my bidding if i have one country rivaling me in a in expeditions i'm gonna basically say hey look dumbass i have a nuke and you don't is it really in your best interest to try to take my the stuff i also want because i could just nuke the crap out of you done Capiche capouche. So that allows if if weaponry or if technology is monopolized and nationalized to the government, that could be a huge, huge winning factor or determining factor in who has power and who doesn't have power on a global scale, not necessarily a domestic scale, which I've really just been talking about in the past five to 20 minutes. It's really a global scale who's going to have power. OK, uh, an example of this is Spain with, or not Spain, but Portugal with cannons. They were able to literally create monopolies on African coastal cities because they were able to do the following. They were able to basically use the cannons as a way to basically tell the African coastal cities, look, we don't have to be really close to you to attack you. We're not going to lose men, but you're going to lose men because you don't have cannons that are as good as ours, and we're just going to blow you up. So might as well just give up your your you know city and your coastal city and just give us the the stuff you have and we're gonna create this power. So that's one example, and there is a lot of you know different military weaponry that I can get into for technology, but just recognize that if you have that weapon and the other country doesn't have it, you have power. Okay. Now, there is one last thing I want to talk about when it comes to social class, economic class, and social things. It's the idea of liberalism. And I know that I'm jumping up and down, but liberalism has actually really been associated with economics and um, social reform. Liberalism is the idea that you give people, there is reduced government intervention. And I don't want to get into political philosophy, but that basically just means reduce government intervention in politics, economics, and social life. Okay. And the reason this is important is because of the following. When you analyze social things, you want to look at them in the lens of the quality of life of individuals. So how are they benefiting, right? How is the individual benefiting from a certain government action? For example, if I give you the right to vote, now you can have your needs met and that will inherently increase your quality of life because you can champion for what you want. So when you think about liberalism and rights and voting things, think of quality of life. Think of who it's going to benefit. And if it's going to benefit the majority of the public, you're like, okay, well, you know, obviously this is good. It's going to increase the quality of life. If you have a good quality of life for the majority of the population, you're going to have stability. It's when the quality of life of people, but especially the middle class that goes wrong or in the shitters, they're going to have a degree of instability and you're going to lead to revolution. So again, when you're analyzing these social reform movements and you're analyzing these economic reform movements, analyze, okay, how is this impact? in the quality of life of people okay and as a result of that if it's going good you're going to say okay there's going to be more stability the government as a result of that can prosper because it's not going to have to deal with domestic turmoil so there's less domestic turmoil and it can prioritize its needs so then if you look at it holistically right not only is the individual going to benefit not only is there an individual benefit but there is an overall societal benefit of stability 
and just prosperity. Okay, so if the if more of a lot of people benefit, then a lot of people are going to be happy. Then the government is going to prosper. Really, the society because the government is composed of society, and then you're going to have this degree of social benefic beneficiary. Um, next up is really social class, right? How does this impact social classes? Okay, this is important because remember my 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 um, analogy to the civil civil war right like how does this impact the poor social class why is the poor guy fighting right because it because your social class prompts you to do things right if for example let's say eating ice cream is a privilege that only the upper class have or the really really wealthy people have because they have the wealth or they're the ones who have control of it well then obviously that's going to be something that's part of their values that's going to be part of their culture right consuming this good but when that good becomes more available to other people, the social class differentiation. So if I were to basically draw, right, let's say this is the between top and bottom. Okay. Top and bottom, right? Let's say this is the divide between social classes. Let's say if really the differentiation between them is like a good, right? Like a, like a, like a candy bar or, or ice cream. Right. And it's only really like if you can get 12 candy bars, right, that means you're at the top. And if you can get one candy bar, that means you're poor. Right. Well, if all of a sudden the bottom people can afford 12 candy bars, what is there to differentiate between the top and the bottom? Right. Now, this analogy, put it like this, can be demonstrated with liberalism or in general, any opportunity in which the people get more privileges. And remember, privileges in history can also be associated with rights. Your rights are not necessarily given to you by God or you don't necessarily own your rights, okay? The government owns your rights. They are the ones who decide if you deserve to have a right and whether you not, do not deserve to have a right because they can take it away from you, right? Rights are not inalienable. They technically are intended to be, but they're not in practicality so as a result of this right and, and really you should look at this in a political and socioeconomic lens right when people get more of something that originally another class had gotten there is going to be a degree of tension there is a higher degree of tension and this could lead to revolutions and the best way i like to think about this is think of a pendulum okay where you have like one thing here right and it swings all the way around and you have another thing here that swings this way okay and it's like those things in the office where like if you hit it it kind of goes one way and then it goes back the other way and it starts hitting one another back and forth when there is a really really far divide okay right between the lower and the upper class there's going to be an issue because the lower class is like well i'm getting treated like shit. i want to get my rights to me Right. And the upper class is obviously going to be like, no, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. So you're going to see revolution stemming from the poor or you're going to see much more action or or reactions from the poor actions from the poor. That is when there is a large divide. OK, and by the way, this is my last topic. There's going to be a large divide when this pendulum between the rich and the poor. Right. I don't want to talk about middle class necessarily right now, but just the rich and the poor begins to swing closer to one another. So if I were to draw this and the pendulum is here and here, which basically means that the poor are getting more rights and the upper class are not really getting anything. When this happens, like, or when, well, actually here, let me draw this again. Let's say that these guys are here, but the poor have managed to swing closer, right? When this happens, and remember that they were relatively here. It's the upper class who's going to get really mad, right? Because they're like, well, what the hell? What, what is there to differentiate between me and the poor person now? There isn't anything. So you're going to see a, a things called reactionary movements, which basically means going backwards in time. Reactionary movements. Um, best examples are in Russia. Reactionary movements by the, by the upper class. So reactionary movements are by the upper class typically or the middle class. And you're going to see reformist movements by the by the middle class as well, by the middle, and also lower class to some degree, okay? It's not always the case that the lower class is going to be the reformist. It's typically a middle class, but it's almost always the reactionary movements that have the upper class. And they can also have the middle class. 
And you're going to be like, well, that's kind of weird. Why would they be reformists and reactionaries? Well, my answer to that is remember that the middle class may sometimes be smart enough to recognize, ooh, I can benefit from this. So if they're going to benefit from it, then they're more likely inclined to probably be with the upper class in the case. Whereas if they're losing a freedom, they're going to be much more reformist or revolutionary than reactionary. Okay. I don't know why I just got really congested, but sorry about that. And by the way, while I say this is really related to political things and your privileges, like your rights, right? So like a right to education, a right to health care. This is also to economics, right? Let's say if a good was only for the rich, right? Like a, a, a really, really nice car um, identifies if you're rich. Like uh, imagine you have like a McLaren, okay? And that is like a symbol of your status. That's how you legitimize your status or a nice piece of artwork. Well, if the poor all of a sudden start getting a shitload of money and they can start driving McLarens too, as a rich person, you're going to say, okay, well, what's the difference between me and that rich guy now? Or not the rich guy, the poor guy. Well, there isn't going to be as much of a difference. So you're going to be like, okay, I want to go back to a state or a system in which I could um, go back to where I was the only one who could have a McLaren. So the history of socioeconomic tensions of socioeconomic tensions is like a tug of war okay socioeconomic tension is a tug of war okay think of it as a tug of war if one side gets too much of something and the other side doesn't really benefit right then you're going to have an issue okay vice versa so if the poor get a lot and the rich don't get anything in return to differentiate themselves still so this is idea of and it's a tug of war because of this topic of social differentiation then you're gonna have a huge huge problem okay anyways so recognize this idea of social differentiation recognize that it comes down to a lot of the tensions that exist within society um there is so much more to cover right i could have talked about banking i could have talked about you know finance while those are always important, understanding these underlying factors of the economy, of society, and a bit of sociopolitics will get you pretty, pretty far, okay? So let me just do this, social class differentiation slash tug of war. If you understand these, you're going to be really, really strong in your understanding of just history in general, because a lot of history, again, is going to be repeated. For example... It's not like nationalism only existed in Nazi Germany and existed in Italy. It existed in Japan and it also existed in America during the time. It was just the relative degree of it. So recognize all these points. And these are going to be really, really great opportunities to kind of nail your LEQs and your DBQs and your SAQs in pretty strong depth. Okay. Anyways, good luck. Thank you for watching.